we're back. All right, for our next session, please join me in welcoming our moderator for the panel discussion, Ms. Jolyn Lim. Jolyn has over 25 years of experience in R&D, regulatory quality, uh, clinical reimbursement and medical affairs. Jolyn is currently the founder and CEO of Agape Life, which is an advisory consulting and contract research organization. And one more thing to our audience, please, uh, questions have already started polling in already. Feel free to post your questions using the Q&A function and we will answer them at the end of the, quest, uh, at the, end of the session, I'm sorry. Jolyn, over to you, please. Thank you, Drake. Um, good morning to everyone and welcome to our sessions. Very honored and privileged for me to be able to introduce you our four distinguished guests of today. Let me first introduce our collaborator for this talk, um, Mr. Alan Tan. Alan is a uh, country manager of Allied Talises and he has over 15 years of experience in all the full spectrums of IOT, which I hope that it includes IOMT as well as IOHT. And he is uh, basically a system integration guru, a very well-versed and very charismatic professional with um, extensive uh, understanding of this field IOT. And next uh, goes to Ken Rich, uh, Dr. Chen. Dr. Chen is a currently a, a system medical director for Cambridge Healthcare, and he has more than 10 years of working experience from various clinical institutions such as Sun Toxin, NUH, and academically, he's very active in publishing papers. So we are very excited to get uh, a practicing medical doctor, Dr. Chen's perspective in introducing their next generation uh, value added uh, consultation platform which is uh, utilized in the uh, company right now. So we'd like to welcome our neighbors, uh, Dr. Gregorius Bitmore, who is a founder and a practicing medical doctor himself. It's very uh, exciting to have you, sir, on, on our panel because it's really interesting to get your viewpoint as you have more than 50 years as a practicing medical doctor as well as involvement in digital health. Um, you are also currently, he's also currently a chairman of the Association of Health Tech Indonesia. Welcome on board. Um, last but not least, our very own Singapore founder and CEO of Dr. Anywhere. I hope this means that everywhere of the world as well, eventually, uh, we welcome uh, Waiman Lim to our panel and he is a regional tech lead in healthcare company. Um, he started this Doctors Anywhere as a service platform to be able to allow all our um, civilians to see a doctor online virtually in every space. So thank you all for coming and joining. Before I go in uh, to the question sessions, I'd like to remind everybody, although this today is really the eighth day of Chinese New Year, we are still within the 15 days, so we still can say Sing Nian Kuai Le to everyone. And, um, just give you a very update of the current COVID-19 pandemic situation. This morning, I checked on the COVID wordometer. It was reported that in the world, there are 110 million people being diagnosed. However, there are only 62 million being recovered. As for Singapore, we have approximately 60K, 60,000 people being diagnosed and approximately 95% of them been recovered. So it's a very good thing from the Asia perspective, and I hope that we will continue to come up with greatest and best uh, treatment to all these patients. While we are, some of the world are still struggling in COVID-19, we would like to focus everybody on how and what we can contribute in the telemedicine side. Let me go to our panel um, for Dr. Bima and Dr. Chen. Feel free to jump in to elaborate your take on how to accelerate new opportunity to boost the organization of individual resilience and the challenges, especially during this pandemic time. From you as a practitioner, medical doctor, how would you see uh, what is your current practicing medicines will add more value to, to, the, to the patients during this pandemic? Dr. Beamer, can we have yes. your intake? So I think it's very interesting that right now uh, we are, like already uh, said before by uh, uh, the keynote speaker, 
that we are actually already done this uh, before as a technology side, but the legal side uh, on uh, how the medical association also allow us to do it right now. It's very important mm. that with a physical distancing and people actually afraid to go to hospital right now uh, mm. because they, they don't want to contract the COVID-19 anyway. So uh, uh, it, is, it is a special time that uh, become a leapfrog for the uh, telehealth. But not only that, because uh, the, the, uh, the remote monitoring and AI, IoT, it's also uh, quite a leapfrog like around three to five years. So we are seeing uh, something that haven't been uh, before. It's a combination of uh, virtual healthcare. So it's uh, a daily with a, a wearables, IoT, and also the on-demand. Because mm -hmm. in Indonesia, especially uh, right now, you also can have a lot of things uh, like healthcare uh, service also delivered to your your place, right? Mm, yeah. What about you, Dr. Cheng? From a perspective of a uh, medical doctor, uh, how would you practice medicine so differently during this pandemic uh, environment? Um, I think this pandemic um, uh, has actually provided us uh, opportunity to actually decentralize some of these uh, services provided. Um, as what uh, Dr. Gregorius actually mentioned also previously, the uh, regulation wasn't in place uh, originally. So this has actually uh, started starting to, uh, you know, have more uh, recognition for telehealth medicine mm. in Singapore. Uh, and um, as uh, Dr. Gregorius also mentioned, but in Singapore, the situation wasn't that bad that people uh, is afraid to go to see uh, medical doctors uh, at this point in time. But we do uh, be able to cut down in the load of uh, in-person consultation by means of uh, you know, teleconsult and uh, you know, for some of these stable chronic uh, patients uh, and uh, you know, delivery of the medicine to their doorstep as well. Mm. So things like stable hypertension patient that, uh, you know, uh, might not be so willing to come down to the clinic mm. uh, with uh, such a stigma, you know, at this point in time, uh, seeing a medical professional, they might still get their uh, medicine and uh, get their appropriate uh, care. Yeah, so there are some diseases, uh, such as chronic, that allowed a regular visit. Telemedicine definitely is very helpful for them mm. at this time, right? Especially for the older generation. <sighs> So let's move to the second question. We are very concerned about the privacy and security of the telehealth, especially from the patient perspective. We know that telehealth, a lot of company will involve your iPhone or laptop, which is computer. And um, as current, 4G is much more of a prevalence platform. How can patients protect their personal data when when clinician is practicing telehealth? And the other question to ask for the protection of clinician while they are providing diagnosis as well monitoring over the, uh, over the IoT platform, how can they be protect themselves from the liability when things are not quite accurately presented? So let's uh, take a, a viewpoint from Alan who is a service provider and an expert in IoT, what do you think? Hmm, hi, okay, thanks, Jolene. I think from the perspective of protection, why mm -hmm. we have two areas. First of all, I think uh, it's everybody's responsibility to protect ourselves. So it started from the provider, just like from, uh, from each uh, doctors or anywhere that you want to choose this thing, you must be well protected in terms of vulnerability access. Mm. So in terms of security wise, uh, we understand that today, uh, there's a lot, a lot of cyber attacks that's everywhere, mm. people to social media. So all this area is a keyword in uh, today's uh, uh, cyber security world. So there's many ways that we can help each other. I mean, from the phone side or, or I mean, from the user side, whether you're having a phone, how well you can protect yourself and from the, the, the provider side or maybe from the uh, doctor side, uh, how you want to protect your network, uh, uh, what kind of uh, protection you should be because mm. uh, you will never end. So uh, as the survey uh, shown earlier on, so we understand that the healthcare side, uh, more than less than 50% is uh, ready because IoT really is a word that incur a lot of sensors, 
a lot of integration that goes on. So all these things plays in part that uh, definitely we have a, a range of uh, different uh, perspective or solution for each to adopt. Mm. And from this point, then we can be better protect ourselves against each vulnerability and access. So mm. doctors, um, patients, um, data can be well protected as well. Mm. Yeah, this is my point of view. Yeah from the practicing um, perspective. Yeah, exactly. let's go to Waiman. Uh, as a entrepreneur and also a founder of a fully online telehealth uh, platform, what do you think about in terms of patient privacy and doctor security in, uh, liability uh, when you are presenting this platform to your current patients? Yeah, I think, I think uh, by and large, I think, uh, Nothing has changed, right? Uh, nothing has changed in a way that uh, the way we treat, um, you know, the data as an organization, uh, it's the same as what is happening uh, in a clinic today anyway, mm. right? So uh, in terms of the process, in terms of the way we, 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 we treat the data as an organization, it's the same now. Um, mm. The other element to it is uh, then how uh, secure uh, would this data be? Right. And then uh, I think that would pretty much fall into uh, you know, uh, the type of uh, uh, system back end um, security <clears throat> um, uh, uh, features that uh, uh, any telehealth company uh, uh, can, would, should be using uh, mm -hmm. in their system. Uh, and, and to us, I, to Doctor Anywhere, uh, we, we do take this very seriously. Right? We do have a, a, a sizable team of, uh, uh, I would say, uh, data security, uh, uh, I would say engineer, right? Uh, working uh, on this day in, day out, uh, detecting vulnerability, uh, vulnerabilities on the system, uh, on a daily basis, patches, so and so forth, right? So um, I, I actually think that this is something that will be uh, evolving, right? There will be more, there will be more efforts, uh, you know, as telehealth, as a sector grows in Southeast Asia, uh, you know, there will be more emphasis to make sure that uh, this thing is uh, not exactly, you know, the, 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 the thing that would help to grow the business, you know, uh, very nicely. Uh, but no. this is something that is, uh, I, would, I would think most users would know that it's a, it's a, it's a hygiene factor. Mm. Yeah. All right. Uh, so, that. yeah, thank you for your perspective. And Dr. Beamer, I'd uh, like to turn this question to you in Indonesia because we all know that Indonesia approximately have 300 million people of uh, the Asia regions and uh, there's a huge amount of uh, people of, with uh, different uh, religious faith that uh, maybe for them to actively visiting clinics um, is not really that uh, liable yet. So in terms of patient privacy and also the doctor who practicing telehealth as of right now, uh, what are the factors that you will, uh, you will hope that they will abide to so that they will be able to provide a delivery care that is an optimal outcomes? Yeah, so uh, the first thing is uh, we already have the uh, National Medical Council uh, like for uh, asking the doctors to really maintain their medical records. That's the first thing because mm. uh, we understand that it is depending on the healthcare providers to keep the, all the uh, medical records, either it's electronic or in paper, right? But uh, the, uh, what we should do is actually moving on to the really full electronic medical record before we are doing telemedicine. That's the, the first thing that actually we need to do, right? Uh, if from the consumer side, I think uh, they they are they are looking for it. Uh, not all for them. Okay, I understand with that because uh, not everyone is really uh, feel better uh, when they see the doctors through their phone screen. Uh, the feeling of seeing doctors and you are already well is very big. Okay, <laughs> so <laughs> that's, that face to face uh, still still so big, but. Uh, I think uh, for, uh, like Dr. Cheng already mentioned before, for continuing care, uh, the chronic conditions, uh, it's, it's, it's far more important for them to have these uh, solutions other than like uh, also seeing the, or, or only seeing the doctors, right? But uh, mm. following up and doing 
uh, what they need to be uh, uh, be done for their quality of life. Right. So uh, the focus here should be not only on the technology side, but also in the uh, how the the healthcare as a whole uh, uh, becoming integrated in this uh, virtual health for the doctors and the patients. And uh, let's say, uh, let's focus first uh, from one or two points, like uh, for the chronic condition patients. Uh, I think they already understand the diabetes patient, hypertension, et cetera. They, they already understand their conditions, okay? They just mm. need the access and uh, uh, the, the reliability to, to do it actually. Yeah, yeah, I do agree. But um, would all of you think that moving from 4G to 5G, the patient privacy as well as security issue need to be even more conscientious because 5G is much more real time. Everything takes place in a split second. Do you agree, Alan? Yeah, exactly. So, because um, I think uh, we know that Singapore is one of the few that uh, we're doing adopt 5G. So, definitely in today's, we also have 5G enabled thing that is ready for the market to go. But uh, on the other hand, um, we, we still need some time because uh, most of the devices behind is not yet 5G ready. So, mm. in order to get 5G ready, of course, the telco must be ready and we are there now. So, I can see many places in Singapore is having 5G signal because I, I did subscribe to 5G to test out all the signal around the uh, mm. island when I move around. So uh, the speed actually indeed is quite a, a fast speed. So it definitely helped IoT to get those uh, data and being analyzed and being, you know, just like Dr. Chi mentioned that we need mm. some time for the data to go back to the server and then trust me out again to show you that this is a thing. That's the reason why until today, um, of course, uh, the survey shows that uh, less than 50% of them is not really... Uh, set up yet, but we are in the process of setting up and I believe that the government is putting a lot of efforts and and emphasizing how we can move into this uh, industry uh, safely and swiftly. All right. So as for, um, I am a consulting a consultant to regulatory product registration. So I'd like to share with all the audience for telehealth. Uh, if your product is being intended for medical purposes, for investigation, detection, diagnosis, monitoring, treatment or management of any medical conditions, disease, anatomy, or physiological process, you will be classified as medical device and it will be fully regulated by our Singapore Healthcare Authority. And uh, for Indonesia, Dr. Mima, do you know anything about your regulation? Uh, does all the clinics who would like to transform themselves into IoT platform, do they need to register a lot of their telehealth related products for supporting IOMT? I think uh, right now we are not really into uh, that regulation. Actually, uh, from the Health Tech Indonesia Association also, uh, we are doing a regulatory sandbox for a lot of things. Uh, we start from the tele, uh, medica uh, telemedicine, of course, uh, learning also from the Singapore uh, Ministry of Health. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are not there yet, but there is a lot of flip uh, with like uh, uh, device like uh, Genos or the TeleCTG that has been uh, run all the clinical trial, etc. So I think we are going to have all the regulation in next like uh, three to four years. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, uh, the clinics that want to do the telemedicine, etc., uh, it's it's quite uh, open uh, to to do it uh, by themselves or uh, partner with a platform uh, like the health tech members. All right. Thank you for sharing uh, from the Indonesia perspective. So let's move forward to another interesting question is that uh, what do you think about the factors that um, affects the adoption of digital medicine as of today? So Dr. Chi have mentioned that we are moving toward a bridging access of all this patient's care by delivering care through all this platform. So it's a very good thing. He gave a very good case uh, example on the AFID, uh, atrial fibrillation patients, which I think is, is, is so amazing. If we can use the technology to be able to prevent AFID or even prevent uh, chest congested heart um, failure in a very split seconds and information can be passed and transformed in, 
uh, transfer into the right physician hand, then the patients of chances of living is much better and higher. So from the perspective of technology, can all of you speaker help us to understand um, as of right now, what are the digital medicine technology advancements that we yet to need to come to um, bring it forward from the medical technology industry? So Dr. Chen. Okay, so actually I look at it in a way that, uh, I mean, I'm looking at the barriers to this telemedicine in three, 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 uh, three factors rather than just on the technology itself. Mm -hmm. uh, first factor, uh, I think the patient factor is a very important factor. So number one, elderly patients, some of them might not be technological, so maybe they might have a smartphone and all those things but they might not necessarily doubt that your platform to, you know, uh, engage you through, uh, through telemedicine. And also, there are also a group of them who prefer to be seen face-to-face uh, -face because mm. of the human touch. So that's yeah. one factor that I think is a barrier in implementing that. Uh, second, uh, I would think that uh, medicine is a very broad uh, uh, practice in which there are also various practices, not only primary healthcare, in fact, I've spoken to some of my uh, good friends who are practicing in, as orthopedic consultants in uh, the restructured hospital. The fact that uh, they also start implementing some of this uh, teleconsult in the restructured hospital in Singapore as well. Mm -hmm. But there are certain things that, uh, there are certain limitations that weigh heavily, especially for the surgical disciplines. Because mm. a lot of them, uh, they depend on their tactile uh, sensation. Uh, they need to look, feel, move, and uh, you know, as, during the examination yeah. to provide enough data for them to you know, tell the patient what condition they have and what sort of treatment plan they have. Yes. So in fact, uh, it's very limited for them in that case that uh, they only see review cases in which they think, uh, you know, either post imaging to tell them the results of the, the MRI results or X-ray results or uh, after they went for physio and you know checking on the patient. So these are the review cases which uh, might not necessarily need you know, a face-to-face -face visit in that sense. Yeah. Uh, and the third factor, of course, is um, despite what Dr. Chi says, I personally have some wish list, you see, uh, like, you know, uh, means of obtaining information about, uh, about the first consult of patients, you know, uh, can be improved. We know that there's a, even, uh, you know, uh, electronic stethoscope nowadays. There's also, like what Dr. Chi mentioned, the ultrasound machine, uh, yeah. which, in fact, uh, is by Butterfly. Uh, I'm not affiliated to that company, yeah, but it has just gone, uh, you know, uh, on the stock market recently or so. <laughs> <laughs> so, but anyway, uh, these are means that, you know, if it could have a transmission of data to the uh, clinician itself, uh, you know, uh, that could actually provide us more information and also uh, assess the patient better uh, from a distant uh, region. Okay. Or, yeah. yeah. So I think I, these I... are the three factors I'll uh, look at. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's a very good um, good suggestions in terms of for the medical technology innovation company. They should come up with better technology in be able to transmit the tecta field. I think that's very challenging for a lot of people. Even surgery can be taken place through virtual reality. Uh, glasses. However, the feel of your patient is not so optimally easily be able to um, innovate into a product yet. But this will give us a lot of hope in terms for those uh, new innovators. They will think about how to improve in this uh, telehealth uh, tool or any of these uh, medical devices that need it. So let's go to Waiman. What do you think about the factors that um, affects the adoption of this digital medicine from your perspective as a practitioner yourself as well? Not a medical practitioner, but you run a platform that's servicing patients. Yeah, so, um, well, that, that there, are, there are many different factors, right? So um, I think um, uh, taking a few steps back, uh, I think 
the sector is still very nascent today, right? Uh, it is still growing very, very quickly. Mm. Uh, uh, there are, you know, still increasing interest uh, in the adoption of telehealth as we are seeing on our platform today, right? Uh, how, how, in, and traditionally, I think uh, in the healthcare space, uh, you have uh, broadly speaking, um, three sets of um, stakeholders uh, that you really uh, want to make sure that they want to participate, right? A, mm -hmm. uh, it's your provider, right? So your medical doctors. Uh, B, uh, it will be your payers, right? So uh, your payers are your insurers uh, and also to, to a good extent in some countries uh, will be the government. And obviously uh, C, the last one will be the consumer. Now, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> To, to increase the adoption to uh, uh, the penetration rate of, uh, 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 of this sector, definitely it's not just about cons uh, uh, convincing any one of them. You have to convince almost all of them to make sure that uh, you, know, you, are, you, 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 are, you are good enough for everybody. Um, and they all have very, very different expectations and they all have very different agenda. Uh, uh, and running their business on a daily basis. So, for example, you know, your consumer really just want to get well very soon, right? Uh, your doctors want to provide uh, uh, the best of care, right? Uh, but sometimes providing the best of care, it can also be expensive, right? And then your payer would think about how do we, you know, uh, reduce the exposure of costs in a sense, right? So, they are all kind of uh, in, in, interlinked. And I think a good telemedicine platform uh, has to act in a very neutralized uh, and very balanced uh, uh, platform to make sure that everybody is served to the best of uh, what they can be, right? Uh, and, and hence, everybody would then participate in this platform together and you lead to a growth. All right. Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah, I think I can see what you are coming from. It sounds like all the clinics or all the setup of uh, practicing telehealth, they do need uh, internal governance so that it will have consistent quality of uh, delivering care to all these patients that is utilizing the telehealth. Yeah, I, I, do, I do see the importance of that. And since we are on this topic, we'd like to talk about the cost. I think uh, some of the clinics and some of our audience who maybe own clinics or hospital chains, they might want to think about how to transform their current novel, normal practice in medicine to telehealth. So would um, Ellen please help us to understand the cost of implementation and the uh, uh, time that it takes for implementing it. Oh, hi. Okay. Uh, I think from cost perspective, I think you see from the video earlier on that uh, I, I did just uh, show up for the Wi-Fi because as the world goes towards the IoT environment, things are going Wi-Fi and uh, of course 5G is also wireless. So now is that how we're going to make this transition sheet because going into Wi-Fi, the next generation will be Wi-Fi 6. Uh, when you talk about Wi-Fi 6, of course, the speed is uh, more, faster. So yeah. can you imagine um, we need a faster speed and seamless Wi-Fi? And if robots are having any wireless setup, uh, imagine you're just halfway doing something and then the robot just reboot. <laughs> so it was quite a, a traumatic thing. So mm -hmm. uh, saying that, of course, uh, the cost why I think it will be quite... Uh, reasonable or acceptable. Uh, when I say that, is that because uh, when you go to late new Wi-Fi or setup, of course, your current hardware may not be able to catch up with the speed. So uh, there's a few ways you can do it, like from in terms of stages, maybe you can implement uh, Wi-Fi first. And then, of course, you need to change your backend also to suit the whole environment to be capable. Oh, but wow. once you are there, um, when things start to connect into your infrastructure-wise, uh, you are more or less ready to be in the next generation of the Wi-Fi 6 technology, which is uh, IoT and all those things coming in. So cost-wise, I think uh, maybe you'll be surprised you'll be not as expensive uh, because there's a lot of ready thing that's outside already there, unless you want to do your own implementation of uh, getting your own device to hook up or, or doing some research or integration stuff to your device. Other than that, there are more than ready enough thing for you to start 
planning over uh, maybe two, two, three years stages so that you are ready for that. Because as I mentioned to you, you still have time now because most of the device is not so ready to the Wi-Fi yet. So we still have some maybe one year to implement or maybe two years so your cost can be well spread and amortized from cost perspective. Okay. Thank you for sharing. I think that's important to know for as a service provider's perspective. Mm. So let's go to Dr. Um, Dr. Cheng and Dr. Bimar. I'd like to get your viewpoint. Oh, okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, for the regarding the cost of implementation, um, basically, I think. Um, Okay, actually, I have a more, more grounded perspective of this because, mm -hmm. uh, like, um, I mean, I have seen both in the restructured hospital and as well in uh, private mm -hmm. clinics. In most private clinics, actually, most of uh, us are on electronic medical record system, which requires internet connectivity to, uh, um, to type in our medical uh, notes. And hence, I think uh, the ease of setting all this up is actually quite easy. Uh, as compared to that of a restructured hospital, because from what I understand, uh, due to the cyber attack of our national database, the electronic medical records of a restructured hospital is actually moved offline and uh, into an intranet sort of, so it's not connected to the internet. So when they are, when my friends are doing their teleconsult, uh, they in fact have to have two separate hardware <laughs> uh, in which there's the Zoom and uh, they connected to their own, uh, to a separate PC via screen to screen tra uh, transmission of the, uh, of, uh, you know, like the x-rays uh, or the uh, images that they want to send to uh, their uh, patient. So in a sense, they are running two systems uh, uh, in order to uh, be able to do the teleconsult properly. Hmm. Uh, Dr. Bima, Bima, from your uh, view of Indonesian um, country, uh, what are the costs or the time it takes for training your healthcare practitioner to adopt into telehealth and get used to this over the Zoom or over any platform for patient consultation? to start yeah yeah i think uh the first time uh when we implement this and, and i have uh uh own uh, experience uh, transforming a few hospitals and clinics into uh telemedicine in in time of pandemic so uh when the needs is there uh, they are really keen to learn actually so <laughs> when you uh, have very few patients coming and uh, you need to do it right so uh, they're, they're very keen to learn and it's very, uh, it's qu uh, quite fast. Uh, our uh, record is two weeks uh, implementing the solutions and uh, in, uh, training uh, every doctors in the hospitals. Uh, but the very important is like uh, Dr. Cheng already uh, explained before, the, it is still a separated between the telehealth uh, uh, system and the EMR. Uh, I have, uh, members in health tech that already integrate they, that too. Uh, so they are based on EMR and then on top of that, they create a cloud hospital uh, for the telemedicines. It's, it's amazing that they already develop like that. Uh, so it, it can uh, shrink uh, the time of implementations. But again, uh, so far I have uh, seen a very long uh, uh, time to learn it up to like six months, uh, but very fast is two weeks. Um, sorry. Oh, that's really fast and that's really excellent. So, um, yeah, it is amazing when under pressure people become flexible. That's a good good attitude to have. <laughs> so, um, the the other thing that um, I actually did when onto one of the telehealth um, consultation uh, just a few months ago is just out of curiosity uh, because I'm very interested to find out how quickly can a uh, so-called patient to receive our medical leave, medical certificate through telehealth. So I did went and, and um, get a consultation. So um, how, 
would you as a practitioner to be able to prevent people utilize telemedicine in a wrong spectrum of utilizing in, in a very bad outcomes where medical certificates are much more easier obtained than the normal way of seeing a doctor? What do you think, uh, Dr. Cheng and Waiman? I, I think um, I think you 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 got a, you, you got a good point there, right? Uh, so uh, I would say when when we when we first started in uh, 2017 2018, uh, I must say that most most of our users who came online, uh, a lot of them were really just going after like you know uh, medical certificates, uh, and uh, it was. It was really a, 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 an MC printer in a sense, right? Uh, uh, we know because uh, uh, we do uh, have a few parameters on our platform that we monitor our users. Uh, and uh, I wouldn't say what are those, right? But it does point to it, uh, you know, someone is just uh, an empty seeker, right? Um, uh, over the past few uh, couple of years, right, things have also evolved, right? As things become a little bit more uh, uh, well perceived, uh, I think users are coming on board right now. Uh, to really use uh, the platform for medical care. Now, um, going back to the point on uh, MC seekers, uh, that, that, that there is one thing about MC seekers uh, that, uh, to be honest, their behavior uh, will be always be consistent. Right? You you cannot really control them, be it uh, online or be it offline. Right? Uh, mm. In in, in an in-person visit setting, uh, according to my doctors, right. Uh, when these days, uh, uh, people are very well researched, right? When they go see you in the clinic, they already have read up on Google uh, on on what condition that they are going after, right? And subsequently, they also be asking for you know that that number of days of medical leave, right? So, uh, it, can can we really prevent that? Uh, answer is no, right? Uh, but uh, can we find out who are the consistent MC seekers? Answer is yes, right? Because uh, exactly on the platform today, uh, our back end, they're all linked, right? So the medical records are being uh, shared between doctors, uh, at least on, you know, the very high level, uh, like, you know, uh, when was the last time you came onto the platform? You know, how many, many, how many days of medical certificates have you uh, uh, been getting? Uh, so these are some of the things that our doctors look at as well uh, before they decide on whether uh, they want to be issuing um, that certificate. All right. Mr. Uh, Chi, what do you think as a medical doctor? Uh, is there much easier to give a medical leave to telehealth platform than you see your patient face to face? I actually totally agree with uh, uh, Waiman here. Uh, you know, it's, there's no uh, good way to prevent all these MC seekers. But I would really like to put up to you that uh, actually there should be a cultural sh uh, shift regarding all these MCs. If you think about it, there are some countries who does not even need the MCs for people to report sick, right? They call out and they have a number of assigned uh, sick leave per year. Yeah, so they must understand that, you know, taking more MCs, you know, eventually doesn't show up good for themselves in their workplace, rather than, you know, uh, rather than, you know, us trying to prevent all these uh, MC seekers. On a, the MC itself, from my perspective, uh, is if I think the person is really sick and he really need a prolonged rest, that is when it's going to be helpful to explain to his boss, rather than the other way around, whereby you know people trying to seek MC as a form of leave, which uh, personally, you know, uh, eventually, I mean, they will fall on their own sword. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we do have uh, we do have at least uh, three, two, three questions here, but I will be focusing on your viewpoint on this question coming from the audience. Um, so this uh, gentleman asked, um, among all our Southeast Asia country, excluding Singapore, uh, the rest of the Southeast Asian country, I think he refers to the nine of the 10 ASEAN country are ready to adopt telehealth. And if the, uh, are there a real surge in consumer demand for such services? If yes, your opinion, which are these countries in Southeast Asia that have already accelerated their digital health transformation? 
Oh, so this, uh, yeah. <laughs> so let's start with Dr. Bima, which is uh, outside Singapore. So you can express yeah. from your... I think I could help representing uh, uh, two thirds of the uh, Southeast Asia uh, <laughs> population, right? So <laughs> yeah. it's so huge for that. But uh, I think even in the rural area, and uh, I have a slide that explaining about the village or rural uh, telehealth uh, solutions, even people climb to three though, just for like uh, e-learning right now. But uh, yes, for the demand, it's uh, very high. It's very... Uh, uh, nationwide in Indonesia, the, the demand. But I think uh, what's uh, really we need to take care is about uh, first the infrastructure, second is the uh, doctor's preparedness or the medical preparedness. Yeah. All right. So in, in Indonesia, we know that you guys already started this telehealth. Um, Singapore is definitely, uh, does Wyman or Dr. Uh, Chang or Alan know about other than these two countries within the 10 countries of ASEAN is uh, picking up this digital health transformation pace? Yeah, so um, um, not only where we, we operate in Singapore, uh, Malaysia, Thailand, uh, Vietnam, uh, and we are launching Philippines very soon. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Biman uh, basically look at two thirds, we look at one third of the market, right? So uh, I, I think um, in general, um, for telehealth as a space to grow, uh, you really need around uh, basically about three factors, right? The first factor would be uh, internet access, right? So when I say access, I don't, I, I really mean like 4G, right? The ability to see each other clearly uh, via a smartphone, right? So uh, penetration of smartphone is also the other important um, factor uh, that we need to have uh, to see uh, in a country. Uh, mm. before uh, we can assess how uh, able they are to uh, uh, to grow in the space, right? Yeah. Uh, the factor actually is into the education of the population, right? right. So uh, in my opinion, I think um, the first factor, which is the education, is something that uh, is actually the most important ingredient uh, in a sense, uh, because in some parts of Southeast Asia today, uh, you know, while it's very... Uh, interesting or it's very uh, uh, easy to say that oh because uh, a certain country is very very big right like you know when we operate in Vietnam uh, Philippines right very scattered uh, very big uh, so there must be a lot of use case for it yeah. uh, uh, but the question here is uh, are they the user the consumer are they uh, educated enough in the sense that you know uh, to telehealth uh, to healthcare in general, to say that, hey, you know, I want to seek help from a telehealth platform, or actually to, uh, to some extent, have they even seen a Western medical doctor before? Right? Mm -hmm. so, so, so that's also a very key question for us to answer, uh, and that really directly influenced the rate of adoption uh, of telehealth in this country. Uh, and yeah. I think uh, in more developed markets, like for example, uh, Singapore, the US, uh, UK and Australia, uh, I, I, I do see a lot more uh, uh, higher rate of growth at this point in time, but I think uh, the rest of Southeast Asia definitely is catching up as well. All right. So there's a, uh, that's a very big, um, big question that's coming to Dr. Chang. So um, as uh, big data is a very prevalent uh, terminology and everybody is talking about big data, we all know that big data is the foundation of AI. Would medical institution shares patient wearable IoT data among each other in a centralized, centralized data lake to make the healthcare AI more mature and have more accurate early disease prediction in Singapore across country? So I guess uh, what this gentleman is asking is, um, is there a centralized, um, such as a Ministry of Health or maybe a centralized hospitals that is linking to any of your practice or your hospital is probably will be owner of all the privacy of the patient data? Um, how would it be possible for you to share? For instance, if this patient is part of your both 
clinics practicing telehealth. They have all this data is residing within your hospitals or clinics. However, this person might be uh, start wearing another device that maybe come from another source or another place, but they do have a so-called a um, data that can be shared between these two different platform and different institution. How would it go about to do this? I guess this is a bigger question of not just a hospital. This is a question of the whole healthcare system of Singapore or the whole healthcare system of Indonesia, how it's set up when it dealing with telehealth. Uh, Dr. Cheng, what's your perspective? Mm, at this point in time, uh, I'm not very sure about this actually, because right now uh, there was a push for all GPs, in fact, to uh, you know be uh, uh, change into electronic medical records because there was originally a push for all these uh, GP clinics to have their data stored in NEHR as well. But as of now, um, I think there wasn't a, uh, there was a delay in the plans eventually. So I'm not sure how about the older GPs that uh, you know that are yeah. still on pen and paper uh, style. So uh, there is still a difference in um, uh, readiness in various clinics. Uh, I should put it that way. And even in our private clinics, uh, our own bank of uh, electronic records are not shared into any HR. As yeah. Well. I understand that. Yeah, this is what I, I learned about our own healthcare system within Singapore as of right now. It's very much of uh, individual hospitals and in individual, basically they are all like in a different uh, national healthcare group. So mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, yeah, for, for the NEHR, we actually can see the, uh, for most of our clinics, we can actually, if we have applied for the NEHR, we can actually see the records from the restructured hospital. But right. the other way round is not yet possible as of now because the push for uh, uh, all information to store in the NHL from the primary healthcare is not yet yeah. fully uh, in place. Yes. Um, yeah, and I also learned that someone, one of my friends who's a pregnant woman who took a test in one of the national healthcare uh, hospitals, they have to repeat taking a test when she moved to another healthcare uh, group. So it's like uh, doing like uh, double testing on herself, which is what uh, she's also have a concern about that. But is that a good point? I think uh, big data is good when you have all congregated at a central location for uh, research purposes, for even sharing so that no redundancy of testing are needed. However, this one takes more, more than just a individual um, national healthcare group. It's just a whole, country's efforts yeah so uh, dr bima in indonesia is it the same thing do you guys have a centralized sharing uh, healthcare information data composite together so the government is very uh, enthusiastic with the satu data or the one health uh, so the, the one oh, wow. health data it's been years but i think an implementation it's very hard uh, we are all still working in silo different healthcare groups, different even from the publics uh, and the state-owned. Uh, I think the, the one of the biggest uh, possibility right now is the state-owned enterprise that they already integrate together all their healthcare. So I think 30, 40 hospitals uh, right now. Uh, but uh, to make this, I think the, the way that we are going to do it is through the COVID-19 vaccinations as an integrated uh, health data. That's it. That will be a very good start. Uh, and it's we are not speaking all the medical records. We are speaking about the uh, the uh, vaccinations data first. Yeah, I think that's the beginning. All right. Thank you all um, uh, for the time concerned. Uh, we are actually up to time, but there are still many many questions, and I believe that uh, Mr. Poon Edric will probably will encourage all. All of us continue our discussion later in the, the um, a few months later, the big conference. So um, thank you very much for all our four distinguished uh, speakers and panelists. I uh, greatly appreciate your participation and thank you for all the questions coming from our audience. This is definitely an exciting topic and I wish all of you well and for all the medical technology, medical devices, industry innovator, I wish you all the best in this area as well because we do need more advanced and more integrated technology or devices so that we can fully utilize the 
the efficiency and the benefits of telehealth, especially during the pandemic time. But we don't know when will be the next wave or next next virus, which is some of the scientists is predicting. So we always have to be ready. So thank you all. And please do feel free to reach out to our speakers uh, via email. Uh, there are many, many good questions. Okay, back to you, Eric. Thank you so much. Hey, thanks so much, Jolin. And thank you again for moderating this session. Uh, thank you so much to Alan, Dr. Cheng, uh, Dr. Biman, and also Waiman for joining us um, in, in, in uh, our fourth episode of IoT Asia Web Engagement Series. You know, it was definitely a very insightful session from ranging from so many things uh, about, first off, what our opinion is in uh, local implementation as, as well as ASEAN. And now we're also uh, expanding so much, you know, into the details of implementing as well as integrating across systems. So this is what IoT Asia is really all about. And uh, I really hope that you enjoyed this session as much as we did. We learned so much. And before we wrap up, please uh, do, do us a favor. Take a minute to complete uh, the feedback in the poll that should be appearing on your screen right now. Yes, there are three main questions that we really need your help with because why? Your, uh, these questions right, will help us to further improve the quality of the WESs. Question one is, uh, what's your overall experience? Uh, do let us know whether it was, uh, you know, exceeded your expectations, met your expectations, or it was below your expectations. Um, let us know as well about the content, whether you think this theme uh, was relevant, it was right, or it was uh, insightful for you, and were you impressed with the whole thing? And uh, of course, lastly, would you recommend this? And uh, for me, of course, sincerely, I really hope that you do, because the more people that join us, of course, the more feedback that we can get and the more we can spread the word out about the, the efforts that we're putting in to help share this content with uh, the IoT community. All right. So do that. Uh, do, do help us to put in your, con uh, your, 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 your details into the polls and your answers, and we will definitely help to improve uh, as we move along. And the next, all right, session that we will have, again, mark your calendars. 19 to 20th of May is going to be happening uh, where we will have all four tracks of real estate, transport and logistics, healthcare, and retail. We'll have speakers from not just Singapore, Malaysia, but also within the region to speak on these respective tracks as well. And uh, lastly, Right. For those of you who have questions who haven't been answered during this session, please don't worry. We'll be taking these questions to the interchange for further discussions. For you to access the interchange, uh, feel free to just uh, uh, scan the QR code on the screen later on, and it will take you to that page. Or you can click on the link that will be provided in the chat as well. Um, again, the next session, please join us, 19th, 20th of May. If you want to also be part of our mailing list, feel free to go to our website, internetofthingsasia.com, uh, to find out a little bit more on how you can be the first adopters and first users of the IoT Asia Plus digital platform, launching proudly on the 19th to 20th of May, 2021. So my name is Edric, and I'm very, very happy to have hosted this session again. Again, big thank you to all of you for spending your first morning, uh, first part of the day with us, and we'll see you again in May. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.